Defense News is proudly sponsored by Navy Federal Credit Union. If you're a member of our nation's armed forces, the Department of Defense, or if your family is, we'd be proud to serve you too. On this episode of Defense News Weekly, a conversation with one of the top officials at the Missile Defense Agency. Find out what topics are front and center for the group that protects you from threats from above. Plus, the Iranian military releases detailed footage of U.S. warships in the Persian Gulf. Have a look at the images it took. Also, secret photos from World War II were made public for the first time. Check out the pictures of wartime Britain from above. And the Marines try out a new tactic for extending the range of the autonomous helicopter, the Fire Scout. Finally, what the heck are the buoy tender Olympics? Check out this little scene competition among members of the Coast Guard in Alaska. It's those stories and more in the latest in news and analysis from the Pentagon to the platoon, here on Defense News Weekly. Welcome back to Defense News Weekly, I'm Andrea Scott. The defense of the homeland has, for decades, largely been in the hands of a group within the military tasked with a very difficult job, defending U.S. interests from missiles launched at America and its military assets. That's the job of the Missile Defense Agency, to defend against threats from above, including emerging technology such as hypersonic missiles. It's a complicated and ever-evolving task that means constant improvement of tools to detect, track, and ultimately destroy potential incoming threats. To talk about the latest in this field, Defense News' Jen Judson sat down with the executive director of the agency for a recent Defense News webcast. Here's part of their conversation. Hello, I'm Jen Judson, Land Warfare Reporter for Defense News, and thank you for joining us here for the SMD Debrief. We're, we're coming in live from the Missile Defense Agency headquarters at Fort Belvoir, Virginia. My guest is Laura DeSimone, Executive Director for the Missile Defense Agency. Laura, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Last year, Vice Admiral Hill uh, laid out his top three missile defense priorities, defending the homeland, hypersonic uh, missile defense, and getting the missile defense architecture established in Guam. Uh, are these priorities likely to shift in the coming years in any way? And if not, um, you know, Explain why these remain important, and if you do see the priorities um, potentially shifting, where do you see things heading? Well, first again, thank you for having me. I'm excited to talk about uh, the Missile Defense Agency as well as our programs here. The, um, our priorities are driven by a couple of really foundational documents. First of all, the National Defense Strategy, as well as the recently conducted uh, Missile Defense Review, as well as the defense planning guidance that, that comes down from the department. So those priorities that you outlined uh, right, right now will, are carrying forward um, as the department, um, of course, with our, the changing threat environment and as the department shifts priorities, then we adjust accordingly. Right now we are nested and, and well aligned under those, those priorities laid out in those documents. Okay. So explain you know, why these priorities are, are so important to the Missile Defense Agency, how it aligns with the Missile Defense Review and the strategy, um, you know, starting with defending the homeland, hypersonic missile defense, and getting that architecture on Guam. Really, the, the key elements to think about uh, missile defense is uh, to, to break it out into a couple major mission areas. The first being homeland defense. Homeland defense is our main mission here um, and it really is to protect the nation against that rogue nation missile threat, um, potentially from North Korea or Iran. So uh, those, those, the department guidance right now and policy reinforces that as our mission to protect the nation against that threat. And I'm sure we'll get into a little bit later about the elements that, that make up that system. There's an inc increased emphasis though on the regional defense aspects of what we do here. 
Um, again, as the changing threat environment, uh, the department has asked us to um, take on additional threats in, in the regional perspective. And so programs like Defense of Guam, like hypersonic defense, those fall under that structure of the regional defense programs. So, um, so as laid out, um, Homeland Defense Program, Next Generation Interceptor, foundational to what we do, and then regional defense programs is, is really our main two mission areas. And why is a missile defense agency pursuing hypersonic missile defense uh, now? Talk a little bit about the threat and, and why this is um, you know, such a high priority now for the missile defense agency. Yeah, ab absolutely. Um, you know, one of the great relationships that we have here at the missile defense agency is with the intelligence community. Um, do a really great job of uh, collecting information and uh, learning about the development efforts that our adversaries are, you know, embarking on. So, um, you know, we have seen uh, testing done by some of our adversaries to develop this new class of missile, this hypersonic missile. And it, it's, it's important because it, it, it uh, changes some of the key attributes of how you actually would play defense, right? This is, this is uh, um, all about making sure that we can play defense against the, uh, these types of missile threats. And the hypersonic missile challenges the way that we normally would execute a defense engagement. So it's really important that we now are working on systems to enhance our sensing capability against hypersonic missiles, as well as uh, embark on a layered defense approach to actually engage the hypersonic missiles. Okay. Let's hone in a little bit on this top priority of, of Homeland Missile Defense. Um, so the agency is holding a competition for the next generation interceptor to replace the current interceptors that are in the, in the ground-based mid-course defense system. And Vice Admiral Hill said that he wanted to keep both competitors in through critical design review. Uh, have the competitors passed through preliminary design review yet? So uh, we're, we're coming up on that milestone here uh, very shortly okay. for, for, both, okay. for both teams. Um, we've completed the system requirements review. Uh, that went very well last year, and by the end of the calendar year, we should have progressed through both competitors' preliminary design reviews. Okay, so by the end of the year, great. So in terms of the critical design review, are you still expecting to then wrap up by the end of 2024? If, if you are closing things out in the preliminary design review in 2023, will they need a year to get to that point? Actually gonna need closer to two years. Okay. Um, there's a lot of work that happens between these two uh, milestones, although I'd, I'd say that, that that general engineering roadmap for development is changing with the advent of, I mean, both of these programs are fully digital engineering right. programs, and we're taking advantage of uh, one of the benefits, which is to accelerate coming through the design concepts and the design trades. So, um, but it is a complex program, a challenging program. So we're, we're expecting the critical design review for both competitors to be in the 2025 timeframe. Okay, okay. Now, both competitor teams, you know, because of, as you mentioned, the digital designs that they're working on, um, have been looking to trying to accelerate and have a faster timeline. Um, based off of where things are now, you know, and the where, where you think the critical design review will land, uh, do you believe it's likely NGI could come online earlier than planned? I know right now the target is 2028. Um, is that realistic at this point, or do you see a chance to be a little earlier on that? Yeah, great question. So uh, the, the requirement for 2028 emplacement of the first next generation interceptors was really driven by you know, the warfighter requirement to get cap new capability in place. Uh, both com competing and winning um, bids had um, acceleration as part of their objective in the program. And we actually, since it's so important to, to get early emplacement as soon as possible, we, in, we incentivized the, the contract structure um, to, to make that a priority. So right now, we're on track for our preliminary design reviews, and I see both competitors being, you know, really having an opportunity to, uh, in, to get through the, the rest of the development cycle and in place early. Okay, excellent. Um, often we don't talk about service life extension. It's not, a, not as sexy as a new interceptor, um, but where is MDA in executing the service life extension program for the ground-based mid-course defense system? Great. The, um, so the ground-based interceptors, or the GBIs, 
Um, they were first in place, the early, the early birds, or as we call them, the early missiles. They were in place in the mid 2000s. Uh, yeah. so, um, so those early versions, we had an opportunity as we emplaced additional ones to add in additional capability, uh, modernized um, the vehicles. You could kind of think of a ground-based interceptor as having two major parts, the, the, the booster stack, you know, the rocket motor stack, three-stage rocket motor, and then the, the kinetic warhead that has the kill vehicle and propulsion for the, for the kinetic warhead. The, um, so right now in place, we have a couple different flavors, if you will, of GBIs. So because NGI is coming on a little bit later, what we wanted to do is pull the early rounds out of the ground and put them through a third service life extension program. So we are right in the middle of that. Actually, we've, we've um, emplaced, re-emplaced, if you will, ones okay. that have gone through a, an extension program and what we're doing there is we're, we're actually breaking it apart into those two pieces. Um, we're taking the, uh, the uh, exo-atmosphere kill vehicle through, um, replacing some you know, limited life components and, and, um, and other modernization, software upgrades, et cetera, and then putting them back together and, and placing them back in their silo. So we're right in the middle of, of doing that for the, for the early rounds, and we'll continue to do that. Um, so this, the, um, the, the great, opportunity that it gives us is just just like your car I'd say you know the, the longer you have it the expected reliability drop starts to drop down a little bit so by pulling the early ones out we're really um, and the version that we're putting back in really increases the reliability and expected performance of that singular missile so that's a, it's a great advantage for the warfighter when we come back more from our conversation with the executive director of the missile defense agency and later, Iranian forces trail American warships in the Persian Gulf. We have the footage. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Defense News Weekly. In part two of our conversation with the executive director of the Missile Defense Agency, we learn about a developing area of interest the placement of missile defense assets on the island of Guam. With tensions rising in the region and both the U.S. and China shifting assets in that direction, protecting the Pentagon's airbase on Guam has taken on increased significance. Once again, here's Defense News' Jen Judson talking with MDA Executive Director Laura DeSimone. So the agency's third priority is getting missile defense architecture on Guam. Uh, how do we get the Guam effort on schedule amid the challenges in developing infrastructure on the island? I mean, Guam was just hit with uh, another typhoon. It's not abnormal for Guam, but you know it, it, that was quite a, a bit of damage there. Uh, what are you doing to get infrastructure in place? What are the challenges? <laughs> yeah, so um, yeah, for, great, great program. I mean, Guam is a critical U.S. territory. Um, out there in the Indo-Pacific region where it's really, you know, as we know, um, you know, threats are increasing in that, in that area. It has historically been an important spot for the Department of Defense, uh, logistics hub, other capabilities out there. As you know, we actually have a THAAD battery on, yeah. on the island now. So as the department looks to increase our footprint on Guam, uh, we were asked uh, to start to look at architectures to lay a defensive, an integrated defensive system out there. So very early on, I'd say that um, it was always, it is a joint Army, Navy, MDA effort to look at the possibilities along with, uh, you know, the organizations up in, up in OSD. So what, what, what came out of those studies was uh, um, an architecture that had elements both of missile defense system assets as well as the Army. So what's happening right now, um, as I'm sure you're following, the, the Army has been designated as, as lead service. So um, the, the various sites that have been identified, and, and I'll touch on in a second, the, uh, the environmental impact statement work that, that is embarking on. But, uh, but, but right now what we're doing is uh, making sure that the, the overall integrated master schedule for the enhanced air and missile defense design for Guam is, um, is uh, achievable, mm -hmm. affordable, 
um, as you know, there's some elements of the Army design and they're bringing in some new capabilities. Yeah, absolutely, um, <laughs> it's a lot of new capabilities. <laughs> and, and then I'd say it, it's not just this enhanced air and missile defense package that we're putting on, there's other department you know, initiatives to put other capabilities you know, onto Guam. So the department is looking holistically at that and making sure that we have a sequenced, logical um, plan put together that that um, you know brings the defensive measures that we know we want to bring to the, to the territory, as well as is uh, you know safe environmentally. You know, making sure the public is is fully um, on board and aware that we do all those sensitive uh, environmental and cultural studies um, as we go to place you know, components of the weapon system in a distributed fashion across the island. So right now that, uh, that teamwork is, is uh, happening and, um, you know, it's, it's exciting to see. And I, I said I'd touch on the environmental impact statement. So we identified Army and MDA, the, the sites, the, and predominantly, you know, almost exclusively on um, DOD lands, you know, federal lands right now. Um, and we, we took the lead prior to Army being designated as lead service and trying to pull together from a weapon system perspective what those sites are and get the process started. Because it is one of the longer processes yes. because there's, there's elements by statute or law that we have to do. Um, and then a lot of planning goes into these different sites, right? So, um, so we took the lead in kind of packaging up the weapon system piece under the environmental impact statement um, process, which is the, the NEPA process. And we actually had those first public scoping engagements a couple of weeks ago on island. So we had uh, you know, several public meetings. Uh, the teams went in and talked to the uh, elements of the legislature and the okay. Guam local governments, uh, did some media engagements, and we got some really good feedback. So that process is, is uh, also advancing. And in other military topics, Iran recently released footage it took of U.S. warships in the Persian Gulf region showing a close encounter between the two countries. Iranian state media showed the amphibious assault ship Bataan in the Strait of Hormuz, the narrow entrance to the Gulf where 20% of the world's oil passes annually. Some of the video was taken from almost directly above the U.S. warship. Other images showed naval elements of Iran's Revolutionary Guard around the ship and running alongside it. The U.S. Navy had not released a statement on the encroachment by press time for our show. Next up, the robots are getting more agile. The Marines completed a first-of-its-kind task recently with an inaugural refueling of a helicopter drone from the tanks of another helicopter. We know, it would have been cooler if they'd done it in the air, but it's still a first-use case of the tactic. The transfer took place during an exercise at 29 Palms, California, and involved a heavy lift CH-53 Super Stallion providing fuel to an MQ-8C Fire Scout. The Fire Scout typically operates from a littoral ship close to shore, but in the event it needs to be tasked farther inland and needs some gas, the Marines needed a way to refuel it. The Super Stallion has that capability, so they gave it a shot, and voila! refueled drone copter. Now just do it mid-air, Marines, and send us the footage. Don't go away. When we return, our personal finance expert, Jeanette Mack, walks you through securing your finances during times of rising interest rates. Welcome back. On this edition of Money Minute, Navy Federal Credit Union personal finance expert Jeanette Mack gives you tips on preparing for rising interest rates when it comes to household expenses. The Fed is expected to raise rates at least one more time this year. So what does this mean for you and your household budget? It means save as much as you can and borrow only what you have to. Beyond that, it depends on your individual situation. But one thing remains the same, always know where your money is going. So go back to basics, make a list, break out income and expenses, what's coming in and what's going out. So it's easier to see where you can save and where you can spend. Another approach is called reverse budgeting. It prioritizes debt repayment and savings goals. Focus on one big goal every month, maybe paying $300 toward credit card debt or adding 500 to savings. Achieve your monthly goal first, then cover your expenses. 
Value-based budgeting focuses on saving for what you value most. Start by making a list of your passions in order of importance. Every month, pay all bills and necessities first, then spend on your top priorities. To each his own budget strategy, the important thing is to always pay your monthly bills and save as much as you can, when you can. Thanks, Jeanette. We'll see you next week. To get more coverage of military and defense topics, pop that turret open and check out Army, Navy, Air Force, and MarineCorpsTimes.com, as well as DefenseNews.com. And to be the smartest sailor on the deck plates, sign up for our Early Bird Brief newsletter, compiled each morning to bring you the latest headlines. It's also an audio. Check out the podcast version out each weekday wherever you get your podcasts. And if social media is where you get your open source intelligence, follow us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and X, formerly known as Twitter. And when we return, it's the Buoy Tender Olympics coming to you straight from Alaska. Get ready for some chain hauling. Who doesn't love a little chain hauling? Welcome back to Defense News Weekly. I'm Andrea Scott. The annual Buoy Tender Roundup in Juneau, Alaska is that most classic of American pastimes. Who doesn't recall childhood dreams of being the strongest rivet hammerer in their hometown or the most accurate line toss competitor? While well, glory in those events and others were up for grabs in this year's Buoy Tender Olympics. Participating crews included teams from seven Coast Guard cutters in the region, and action kicked off with the chain pull, in which teams hauled a 1,700-pound chain from a jumbled pile into an organized serpentine pattern. Then there was the line toss event, a test of accuracy over distance. Up next was a good old-fashioned tug of war, always a tough event on a wet surface. Following that, there was the poetry in motion of the Boom Spot competition, in which a member of each team used the boom to guide a bucket of water through an obstacle course without spilling it. But nothing excites a crowd like the good old heat and beat, in which teams hammered a heated rivet into a shackle with sledgehammers, and then one tiny little hammer. Fastest crew to set the rivet wins. A release from the Coast Guard didn't mention the winners, but in a competition like the Buoy Tender Olympics, don't we all sort of win? In other military-related news, secret World War II photos that show wartime Britain from the air are being made public for the first time. The pictures taken by American aircraft on practice flights over friendly territory before embarking on missions over Nazi Germany show details of England in defense mode. It's amazing looking at these photographs. Scattered around in the fields and also on the airfield itself, we have the aircraft. Reconnaissance missions in World War II were especially dangerous for the crews, as the planes often were stripped down to be flying cameras on longer than average missions. The photos show towns, airfields, and other landmarks from wartime Britain a snapshot of the country from the mid-1940s. It was very dangerous. You had no um, weapons. They've been stripped out of your aircraft to provide extra space for your extra fuel so that you can get out to your targets and come back. The only things that you've got in your favor are your speed and your ability to fly. They really were crack pilots. One area, now the Newbury Racecourse, was also home to American troops who were rumored to have buried ordnance in the facility before they left. There were rumors that some of the ordnance and tanks and vehicles were buried underground, so we had to get local architects in to excavate three or four holes at huge expense, and I think all they found was a teapot and a roll of barbed wire or something like that. And that's all we have time for in this episode. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week.